functional radius surgery, uh, obviously, you think about uh, tremor, uh, thalamotomy, pallidotomy, uh, cingulotomy, um, and, uh, and then also treatment of trigeminal neuralgia. Um, if you remember the, the textbook um, chapter on trigeminal or on essential tremor. Uh, essential, it's it's a very common movement disorder. Uh, prevalence is up to twenty percent uh, at the age of ninety. It gets uh, more prevalent as you get older. Um, it's mostly an action tremor. Uh, as opposed to Parkinson's disease, which is more of a rest tremor in, in most cases. Um, and of course, essential tremor affects the hands primarily. 50% um, of cases are familial, and it's an autosomal dominant uh, inheritance pattern with variable penetrance. So you may have multiple members of a family who, who uh, have the disease or the disorder quite severely, and others, other families where it skips generations. Um, and uh, the, the inherited form uh, very often starts quite early in life, even you know, mid to early teens. Uh, kids will say, or people will say, yeah, as a kid, I, I always thought I was nervous. Um, but you know, when they're 50 or 60, it's actually essential tremor. Um, it can get quite severe and uh, uh, disabling. Quality of life uh, becomes quite poor for a lot of these people. Uh, whoops, sorry about that. Um, and just things that everybody takes for granted, signing your name on a check, um, drinking a cup of coffee, become impossible uh, in, in some cases. Um, but also, just the, the things that people like to do, hobbies, women like to knit, um, guys like to tinker around in the garage with their, their tool bench or workbench. Uh, but even just, uh, you know, with smartphones nowadays, typing out a phone uh, number on a, on a keypad can be impossible. Um, so it, it does create a lot of disability uh, in the patients that get really severe. Um, it can even create disability in people who are, where it's not severe. I've seen, you know, people, professionals who, you know, it's, it's impairing their, their livelihood. I had a younger uh, patient, a lawyer, who uh, uh, couldn't go into court because it looked like they were nervous to stand up in front of the jury and, and, uh, or sit at the table in front of the jury and hold a paper. Um, so it can be even at a, a less severe uh, stage impactful on, on people's life and livelihood. Uh, of course, Katherine Hepburn is a famous uh, uh, patient or a pa famous sufferer of uh, essential tremor. You may not know, but uh, Samuel Adams, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, had uh, essential tremor. There's somebody that actually wrote a article in neurology about it uh, back in 2001. Um, you can see, I'm, I'm not going to, but uh, this is in 1865. He wrote this, and you can see the little shakiness of the line, the underlining there. Um, Did this tremor improve with alcohol? Uh, I don't. I don't think it's it's mentioned in the in the paper whether it did or not. Um, yeah, but the, yeah, maybe maybe there was a reason he went into brewing. Absolutely. Right. Exactly. So yeah, this may be this may be on treatment, right? Yeah. Right, exactly. Um, and then as he got older, this was 20 years later. 22 years later, you can see the the amplitude of the tremor is is. Uh, increased um, frequency is about the same, um, and then it, there's it discusses you know that he actually there was some some of the descendants had tremor, uh, but by age 70 71 he was completely unable to write, and this is you know obviously somebody who's 
been quite instrumental in, in the, the political discussions of the day, and he's, he can't write letters anymore. So, yeah, very important. Yes. Um, so pathophysiology of uh, essential tremors, a little bit different um, than, uh, than Parkinson's disease. It's not exactly known what the, what the defect is in, in uh, essential tremor, like you have the loss of substantia nigra, uh, dop dopaminergic neurons in Parkinson's disease. Uh, it, it does involve the cerebellum and the cerebellum-thalamocortical tracts. Um, you know, control of motor function, voluntary movement is a fairly complex series of feedback loops. Um, and, uh, and tremor occurs when you have a problem in the modulating uh, feedback circuits. Um, and as you can see, one of the uh, one of the sites that's important is the thalamus, and when you later in the talk you'll see that this is actually one of the targets for treatment. Um, there have been some uh, genes linked to essential uh, tremor, uh, HAP1, Lingo1, and the GABA, GABA receptor gene uh, mutation. Um, some of these also occur in Parkinson's disease, uh, progressive super, supranuclear palsy and uh, multi-system atrophy. Uh, there's a neurotoxin called harmaline or harmane that is found in meat, and it has been shown epidemiologically that meat consumers have a higher incidence of essential tremor than, than people who don't eat any meat. Um, uh, harmaline is also found in the CSF of Parkinson's disease and some cancer patients. And actually, if you apply it to the inferior olivary nucleus, you get a nice model of essential tremor in rats. Um, so th that also indicates some, uh, you know, probability that it's uh, a defect in cerebellar function. Uh, lead exposure has also been uh, um, associated with tremor. Um, again, uh, tremor in uh, the tremor in essential tremor is mostly an action or postural tremor, uh, but uh, as the disease progresses, um, uh, it does become uh, oftentimes a resting tremor. Um, usually the hands are affected first, uh, and the amplitude will increase over time, um, not the frequency usually, which stays about 4 to 12 hertz. Um, it can also affect the arms head, chin, jaw, voice, trunk, and legs, although the last two are, are less common. Uh, people with essential tremor often have, uh, uh, well, not often, but sometimes have uh, features that blend across into Parkinsonism, Parkinson's disease, um, but they actually don't have the disease. I mean, this is a movement disorder. It's kind of a spectrum of, uh, of diseases. Uh, you can have an impairment of gait and balance, which often brings up the question, is this more Parkinson's uh, than, than essential tremor? And of course, uh, you can have worsening of the tremor in stressful situations, giving presentations, um, <laughs> standing up in court and, uh, and talking to the judge or jury, um, caffeine, exercise, um, and again, as uh, Steve mentioned, suppressed by alcohol. Uh, that's one of the hallmarks of the disease. Um, if, it, if, if you have a patient who's got a tremor and you're not sure what it was, if they tell you that they have a couple drinks and it gets better, that's almost certainly what it is. Um, to rate the tremor, there's a, there's a uh, tremor rating scale called the FTM scale. Uh, they have people do a handwriting sample and a spiral drawing. You can see on the right there, there's a fairly severe tremor um, with the, you know, the, the looping. Once it gets to that point where they're pulling off the page, they can't even keep their hand on the page, you, can, you, know, you know that it's a, a severe tremor. Um, treatment of tremor, there's obviously medications, deep brain stimulation, Dr. Gwynn and his colleagues. 
uh, do a lot of that. Um, thalamotomy has been around for a long time. Actually, one of the first uses of gamma knife was to do destructive lesions in animal models by Lars Lexell back in the 50s uh, in Sweden. Um, when I was a resident, we used to do radiofrequency thalamotomy. Uh, it was a more invasive procedure. Um, and then, of course, uh, focus ultrasounds have become uh, approved recently. Uh, and again, Ryder's doing some of that. Um, primadonna and propranolol are the mainstays of medical treatment. Most or a fair number of patients get uh, gets, uh, a response to that, but oftentimes the, the tremor, as the tremor worsens, they have to increase the medication dose and you start to get side effects, fatigue, cognitive impairment, hypertension, bradycardia. Elderly patients can't tolerate these medicines forever. Um, other medications that uh, people try to pyramid, although that one tends to have a lot of cognitive side effects. Um, uh, benzodiazepine is not a great treatment strategy for it. Um, you know how deep brain stimulation works. The advantages of deep brain stimulation over thalamotomy really are um, that you can do both sides at the same time. So somebody who has a severe bilateral tremor, um, you implant electrodes in both sides of the brain. It's not a destructive lesion. Or it's not a destructive uh, treatment. So uh, it is possible to, to treat both sides. And of course, the response is pretty immediate when you turn the, the uh, device on. And you can take it out if you need to and really kind of no harm, no foul um, for the most part. Uh, Elevated risk, however, in people who are 80 years of age or older, so most centers do not implant uh, people that age. Um, you do have uh, hardware issues as time goes on. You've got to replace the battery. Uh, you can't have an MRI, so older people you know, might need uh, these types of things done. You have to explant the system for serious conditions. So thalamotomy is a, a pretty good option especially for older people. There's no real medical contraindications or age restrictions. Uh, you can have a, an MRI, at least here at Swedish, we, we treat people with pacemakers. You have to go on the, the 1.5 Tesla magnet instead, uh, but it's safe. Um, there's uh, serious permanent side effects in only one to 2% of patients. Um, and we'll go over some more uh, statistics in a second. Um, the downside, of course, is that it's not an immediate effect. You, get, you don't start to see an effect for two months, and, and it's usually not maximal by about, you know, until about six months. And of course, side effects can, uh, can take 12 months or more to show up. So um, it really is a, a, a waiting game. But a, you know, in some who's had tremor for 40 years, Six to 12 months is not necessarily a deal breaker, you know. Um, so the treatment uh, itself, obviously, it's based on the use of frame and image guidance or image uh, imaging. Uh, we do T1 proton density and uh, tractography, looking for the internal capsule and the dentorubrothalamic tract. Um, you have to identify the uh, anterior and posterior commissures and, and find the midline. Uh, and then that measurement between the two uh, gives you your, um, your target coordinates. Uh, the VIM, which is the target for uh, essential tremor, is uh, located superior to the ACPC plane a few millimeters. Um, it varies in terms of the laterality. Uh, and then we go a few millimeters posterior to the mid commissural point. So you just divide the, the commissure in half and then go just a little bit posterior to that. That gives you your target. Um, but of course, you know, it has to be adjusted a little bit uh, for individual uh, thalamic variation, anatomic variation. Um, 
A Japanese uh, uh, center started do, uh, using sector blocking with the Gamonic Perfection, which allows you to shape the volume a little bit more, and you can uh, pull the dose in from the internal capsule, which is, of course, just adjacent to the, to the uh, VIM nucleus, and uh, theoretically, at least, reduce the risk of, of uh, uh, complications related to um, damage to the internal capsule. Um, and then 135 gray is given to, uh, of course, the 100% uh, isodose r rather than a lot of what we're treating in, in radiosurgery is to the 50%, like we're doing a MET or a tumor or something. Uh, but for, for functional neurosurgery, it's all to the 100%. Um, you wouldn't want to give 135 gray to the 50%. You'd end up with a devastated patient. Um, this is a copy of Dr. Young. This is Dr. Young's copy, the Shelton Brown Atlas, which uh, um, you can actually, it's downstairs if you want to ever go look through it. Um, Is it based on like a, a drunk French woman or something? From the specimen of the, like a alcohol this one? French, yeah. <laughs> some kind of alcoholic French woman. I don't remember that. Uh, but anyway, here's the, here's, uh, you know, one of the, the slices. Um, you can see the anterior and posterior commissure, the thalamus. Um, and this is basically what we're targeting off of. Uh, the internal capsule, of course, just lateral to the thalamus. This is hard to do standing here. Um, but basal ganglia. Um, and this is the target, the VIM nucleus. Uh, this is a this is a a, a slice that is five centimeters posterior to the mid commissural point. And of course, the laterality uh, varies with, from patient to patient. Um, so when we do our targeting, uh, this is what it looks like, uh, axial, coronal, and, and sagittal images. Um, the, the target usually ends up being somewhere in the anterior half of the, the, the thalamus. The pulvinar, I find, is, is quite variable uh, in size, and so you have to kind of ignore that. Sometimes the, the shot looks way too posterior, uh, but it's because people's pulvinar uh, is different size and shape, uh, and you really have to trust the, the, the measurements of the ACPC. Uh, that really gives you the... the accurate targeting. Um, here's a case that uh, uh, was being treated contralaterally. You can see the, the, um, the lesion in the VIM area of the thalamus right here. And they're going to do the other side to treat the uh, opposite trauma. You also see quite a bit of brain atrophy up here. <laughs> Must be an older patient. Um, and here again is a, a, a nice example of a, you know lesion in the VIM nucleus of the thalamus compared to the you know the actual Shelton Brown at atlas. Um, quite a nice uh, image of the of the nucleus uh, after treatment. So there are four studies. Uh, that have been published that are reasonably large. Um, a couple of them are retrospective. One or two of them are actually prospective. Um, they're not randomized or anything. Um, Dr. Young and the group here published a, a series of 172 patients retrospective review going back to the early 1990s uh, when he started treating people at uh, Northwest Hospital. Um, the dose range in, uh, that he used to use was a little bit higher than, than most people use now, up to 150 gray. Um, uh, but the, the results were reasonably good. 80% or so patients had more than a two-point uh, reduction in their scores, um, which turned out to be significantly statistically significant. A study from Japan, another 72 patients, closer to the, to the standard dose. Uh, they use the uh, Parkinson's rating scale rather than the, the tremor rating scale. Uh, but again, 
um, fairly significant reduction um, and pretty good results. You notice that all of the results for tremor uh, end up being right around 80% good to excellent responses, even with DBS. Um, I think that's probably just uh, inherent in the disease rather than in the treatment. It doesn't seem to matter what, uh, what treatment you, you undergo. There's, you, you kind of have the ceiling of about 80% of patients will respond well to it. Um, study out of the group at Pittsburgh, retrospective, 97 patients, including some Parkinson's tremor and uh, MS-related tremor. Again, the same uh, dose range that we use here. Um, reasonably long follow-up, and again, pretty good statistically significant uh, reduction in tremor scores. Uh, more recent study out of Marseille, um, 130 gray again, 50 patients. This was prospective both essential tremor and Parkinson's, um, and they had, uh, uh, they, they reported a 54% uh, improvement in the tremor score um, and 70% uh, in, in overall activities of daily living uh, at one year follow-up. Um, complications uh, range from zero to 8%. Um, we quote 8% based on Dr. Young's data. Um, half of those are permanent. So in his uh, report, uh, or in his paper, it was six out of 14 patients had permanent complications. Um, and uh, one to 2% of those were severe. Um, the reason for complications and and or a poor response have to do with the response to the to the actual radiation. Some people uh, respond normally. You get an appropriate size lesion and uh, good outcome. If you don't, res if your brain's resistant to radiation, you, do, you for whatever reason you can repair the the uh, uh, molecular damage. Uh, you'll get a uh, lesion that's too small, and you won't get any result, any effect. Um, but then there are also patients who who have a uh, uh, larger than normal lesion that develops over time, and those are the patients that you tend to see, or that you see have complications because um, you get spillover of a lesion into the internal capsule or the the um, uh, VPL VPM nuclei of the thalamus, uh, so sensory loss. Um, we don't do uh, uh, thalamotomy, at least here, using anything but the gamma knife. Um, this is because the, the dose uh, concentration with gamma knife is much better than with a LINAC. Um, you can see uh, using a four millimeter collimator, uh, you can get 30 gray to a pretty tiny volume. Uh, to try to do that with the, the cyber knife, you end up with a volume that's almost twice as big that gets 30 gray because uh, the, the, you don't get the same hot spot as you get with gamma knife. Um, so gamma knife dosimetry is better, uh, and that's why we use it. Um, People uh, are somewhat wary of having a frame uh, applied, uh, but it actually um, it, it provides comfort for both the patient and the physician because you know the head's not moving. Uh, whereas in a, a, a mask fixation for CyberKnife, you get you still have some movement, even though they say the, the accuracy is down to about a millimeter or less. Um, but the patient can fall, most of the patients fall asleep while you're having, because you're on the table for an hour and 15, 20 minutes, uh, getting 135 gray. It gets longer as the, as the sources get older too. Um, so for the future, uh, there some, be nice to have some more prospective studies, better follow-up and blinded evaluations. Um, 
better understanding of the response uh, of each individual patient to the radiation. Why do some people respond? Why do other people you know, have inadequate response or over response to radiation? Uh, maybe there's some sort of you know marker that you could uh, test for that would predict what the what the response will be. Um, Nobody does bilateral thalamotomy at the same time. We do sometimes do contralateral thalamotomy. If the patient has a good uh, result and wants the other side done a year later or more, we'll do that. Um, but uh, uh, there is um, some indication that the complications of that are a little bit more common than might have been uh, thought in the past. Um, and Part of the study that we're that, uh, that the group here at Swedish is running, uh, looking at uh, uh, thalamotomy for essential tremor, <coughs> includes bilateral uh, patients. Um, so far, there's 149 patients enrolled, 144 have been treated, and uh, just about half have been reached the, the one-year follow-up, and we're starting to see some two-year follow-ups now. Uh, so hopefully by next year sometime we'll have some good data to present, maybe the Gamma Knife meeting in Dubai or something. And that is about it. Here's a, you may have seen this in the Alaska Magazine or, or Southwest Airlines on uh, when you take a flight. Um, but this is what you can, what you can see uh, a year after Gamma Knife. Um, when they do well, they, they love it. They're great. That's pretty much it. <laughs>